Buonasera, benvenuti, welcome or welcome back to the Briar Center for Overseas Studies in Florence of Stanford University. For those of you who might not know me, my name is Benita Hamtani, I'm the director of this program. And it is with great pleasure that I'm here to introduce the first of our lectures tonight, and above all, to introduce Professor Timothy Burden, who's accepted uh, my invitation to come inaugurate our Incontri a Palazzo for the fall quarter. I have a long volume to read, some of it I know very well because I've known him for a long time, but I'll read it all the same. Monsignor Timothy Bergen is a Roman Catholic priest, is a canon of the Florence Cathedral, and is also the director of the Mount Tabor Ecumenical Center for Art and Spirituality at Barga near Luca. A Yale University trained art historian, he is the director of the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo in Florence, which is currently undergoing a major but extraordinary restoration. Uh, he's also the director of the Office of Cultural Heritage of the Archdiocese of Florence, and he holds the Burke Family Teaching of Art History position at Stanford University here. He's been teaching at this program since 1998. So that's a long time. And we hope that he will continue to teach for us for an equally long, if not a longer time. A former consultant to the Vatican and fellow of the Harvard University Center for Renaissance Studies here, uh, Villa Itati, Bergen has organized a number of exhibits and is extremely uh, well and widely published. Let me only mention the three exhibits that is organized in one year alone, between this year and next year. And one of these exhibits are, is, in fact, going to be the topic of the, uh, of the talk tonight. Uh, he, uh, uh, well, he had an exhibit in Turin, but most importantly, he organized an exhibit called The Beauty of Christianity. This was at the National Palace Museum of Korea in Seoul, South Korea. This was this past August. Uh, and, and it was on the occasion of the Pope's visiting uh, South Korea that the exhibit opened and in fact has uh, since been attracting large crowds, a lot, very large numbers of people. I've read a number of articles on the Italian press about it. He's also organizing an exhibit in Washington, D.C. that is called Picturing Merit, Woman, Mother, and Idea, which is the topic of our conversation tonight. And this is going to be at the National Museum of Women in the Arts, and it will start on December 5, 2012. So in a month, a couple of months from uh, now. He also is organizing yet another exhibit, this time in New York City, and the uh, title of that exhibit is Culture in the Age of Donatello, Renaissance Masterpieces from the Florence Cathedral. Uh, this is at the Museum of Biblical Art, uh, and it will start, it will open on February 20, 2015. So if you have friends or people that you know in either Washington or New York or both, let them know about these exhibits, which, however, were very much discussed in the press. Uh, the New York exhibit got an article in the New York Times, and they said the Biblical Museum made a coup because they have a very, they're celebrating their 10th anniversary with this exhibit and they said, New York Times said, you know, it was quite a coup on their part to be able to, uh, to attract these works of art. Professor Bergen teaches six classes for us. He also is the author of a number of books. Again, here, let me just mention the two books on which he's currently working. One is a four volume study of the biblical sources of the Sistine Chapel the frescoes in the Sistine Chapel, and this is due to come out uh, from the Vatican Museum Press soon. Uh, he's also uh, writing another book, this one is on Fra Angelico, and this is going to be for the Sole 24 Ore Grandi Libri series. The Sole 24 Ore, for the students who might not know, is a very well-respected national newspaper, mostly financial, but it comes out on Sunday with a great literary supplement, and it's extraordinarily well respected. It's like the uh, literary supplement that you get with the New York Times or the New York Review of Books. In any case, you're a very busy man, so I'm glad you took the time to speak uh, tonight at this, uh, uh, the beginning of our lectures uh, of our Encontre Palazzo. And the title of the talk tonight is Mary, 
Woman, Mother, Idea, and Art Exhibit in Washington in December 2014. Thank you uh, for coming, Timothy. My, my thanks to Linda, especially for putting everything in the present tense. Uh, the same text in the past tense would be a perfect obituary, right? <laughs> um, but uh, um, I'm uh, happy always to uh, accept invitations from Linda to speak uh, at Stanford. Uh, I very much enjoy teaching the Stanford students, and I'm told that uh, many of the uh, students are here this evening, so uh, even though I may not meet you by name, perhaps some of you I'll meet in the next few days in class. Uh, welcome to Florence. I'm sure others have said it, but let me add my welcome and uh, my thanks to all of you who've uh, come to uh, uh, hear me talk about this uh, event, which I think is uh, really rather interesting. Uh, it is uh, an exhibition, uh, an exhibition uh, that uh, is... Uh, that was asked of me by the uh, elderly lady you see uh, at your left on the screen, uh, whose name is uh, Wilhelmina Holliday. Uh, with her is the First Lady of Florida, and Scott. This is a photo taken uh, off the uh, web. Uh, but it's a good photo of uh, Billy, as she's called by uh, her friends. Uh, and she is uh, the principal founder of uh, an institution the existence of which I knew nothing until they contacted me, but uh, it's actually rather distinguished and it is uh, celebrating its uh, 25th anniversary. Uh, it is the National Museum of Women in the Arts uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, very near the White House uh, on K Street, uh, in premises that uh, were originally constructed to be a Masonic temple, so uh, throughout the building in the uh, stucco moldings in the very handsome early 20th century interior. There are these large uh, letter M's uh, which have to do with uh, uh, Freemasonry, but which in the case of this exhibit will seem to stand for merit. Uh, I find that uh, uh, almost hilarious. Uh, but, uh, uh, at all events, uh, Billie Holiday founded this uh, museum because she perceived correctly that um, the world of high culture uh, in the United States uh, in those years, which were the late 70s and early 80s, but really to a large degree even today, uh, tends uh, quietly and uh, rather uh, unreflectively to uh, exclude uh, women. This is less true today in terms of contemporary culture, but in terms of older culture, in terms of museum art, as it is traditionally defined, uh, very little attention uh, has ever been paid to women artists, uh, who have been few uh, in uh, history, at least those who are well documented and uh, from whom we have significant works, and yet they existed. It is an important theme. And so uh, Billy and a group of wealthy friends uh, decided to create this uh, museum uh, with a small permanent collection of works by uh, women artists from the Renaissance to the present, uh, which uh, serves, uh, I would say, chiefly as a showcase for exhibits uh, by uh, women artists. And uh, she and others on the board uh, had read a book that I did several years ago uh, on Mary in Western art, uh, and uh, since they had long uh, nurtured the idea of doing an exhibit on Mary, uh, Mrs. Holliday told me that when they were uh, planning to found the museum and basically contacting uh, women in important positions throughout the states, this is the end of the 70s, uh, they were all much younger, they were probably all very rag chic and uh, so on, uh, from numbers of these uh, women, uh, they heard that sooner or later they would have to do an exhibit on the woman who more than any other figures, uh, certainly in Western art, uh, who is uh, Mary. Uh, Mary, who in Western culture uh, has occupied a unique uh, position, uh, certainly 
uh, in ages of faith, uh, but then uh, through the artifacts produced by those ages of faith, uh, directly or indirectly even in ages less marked by uh, Christian faith. Uh, and so uh, they decided that they wanted to do a major exhibit on Mary. They liked my book and they contacted me. I really had never heard of them. I got this email saying, we read your book and want you to do an exhibit. And um, I, I went to Washington and talked to them and was impressed with what I saw and with the uh, seriousness of their intention and uh, all of this about uh, four years ago because we basically uh, got off to a false start uh, in that the uh, person put in charge of the fundraising campaign at that point, you know that these kinds of exhibits cost a great deal of money, you have to um, uh, basically uh, pay uh, insurance and shipping for extremely uh, rare uh, and uh, uh, important uh, works. Uh, in some cases you basically pay rent for them because the museums or the private owners say, yes, I'll let you have it, but there's a fee, and okay, uh, that's done too. But uh, at all events, the person that uh, Billy wanted in charge of the fundraising campaign uh, uh, got off to a bad start, I believe. Uh, you won't tell him that I said that. At all events, we, we lost about a year. At one point it looked as if the exhibit would not get done. Uh, and then uh, she said, I want this done. And she basically uh, guaranteed uh, the money needed for it uh, out of her own pocket. And then I think they were able to put it together so it doesn't all come from uh, Mrs. Uh, Holiday, Billy Holiday. At all events, I wanted you to meet her because in some ways it's a very personal exhibit for her and for uh, other of the original founders, and I think for uh, all of the uh, women from across the states. I was present at one of their uh, open board meetings uh, about a year ago, and it's, it's very impressive. Uh, and that's uh, a help to me to know that uh, it's not simply uh, an element uh, on their cultural calendar, but an exhibit that uh, means a great deal to them, and that in some uh, respects is a part of their history. It's a part of their history that they've known from the beginning they wanted to do, but they're doing it only now. My objective was to uh, talk about Mary as a woman, uh, that's to say to focus on Mary's womanhood, uh, and to do that through very significant works of art, uh, and uh, that uh, up the ante in terms of fundraising, because uh, if it had been 30 or 40 minor works, it would all have cost a great deal less. Uh, one of the very important works, which I show you simply to open our discussion this afternoon, uh, is this uh, drawing by Michelangelo uh, in the collection of the Casa Bonarotti here in Florence. Uh, what uh, you could almost call a presentation drawing, that's to say, it's not a sketch, it's not uh, a uh, preparatory drawing for something else. Uh, it is a work in its own right, uh, which is highly finished, particularly uh, in the body of the child, uh, which uh, Michelangelo actually sculpted, as it were, uh, using uh, 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 colored pencils, uh, in order to bring out the uh, physical force of the child. Uh, you say, goodness, uh, that's a kid that spends a lot of time at the gym. <laughs> Michelangelo here uh, was uh, developing a tradition uh, born in Florence uh, a century uh, earlier, or really at the time he does this drawing, not quite a century earlier. This is probably a drawing of the uh, 15 uh, teens or early 20s. Uh, about a century earlier, Masaccio, uh, in a painting now in the Uffizi, uh, had shown Mary and the Christ Child. The Christ Child is, uh, in that work of the early 1400s, uh, quite uh, muscular. It's a painting with Mary, the Christ Child, and Mary's mother, St. Anne, uh, called in uh, Tuscan, Santa Anna Meterza. Uh, St. Anne is the third figure in a Madonna and Child painting. And the reason for which Masaccio made the Christ Child so clearly uh, a uh, miniature athlete uh, deriving the child's body from his precocious study of classical sculpture has something to do with the way in which uh, the Old Testament uh, speaks of the Messiah. 
the New Testament nowhere says that Jesus had muscles, certainly not when he was a baby. The Old Testament speaks of the Messiah as a powerful warrior. And so putting together uh, the uh, poetic uh, Old Testament references with uh, the New Testament faith that Christ is indeed the Messiah, uh, artists began to express uh, that uh, Old Testament notion, even in the child of Jesus, at the same moment that they become interested in uh, classical sculpture, and that is the early 15th century. Michelangelo is picking up on this. Uh, this drawing is one of the works in the exhibit, and it immediately uh, raises uh, a question which uh, they had to face, because I called it to their attention forthwith, uh, namely that for a museum that normally shows only works by women and that collects only works by women, the exhibit that they were asking me to organize uh, would uh, be comprised largely of works by men. Uh, there simply aren't enough important women artists uh, to put together uh, anything more than a curiosity exhibit. Uh, and they agreed to that. But uh, as I say to my students in a course I do in the uh, winter semester on uh, the woman in Florentine art, uh, the paradox, uh, as you try to grasp what it meant to be a woman, what it meant uh, to men to uh, see uh, women, uh, as you look at uh, older art, the paradox is that the images of the women are almost exclusively painted by men. We don't have evidence that the women objected to them, uh, since indeed some of them are uh, commissioned by women. We suppose that they accepted them, uh, but the fact remains that uh, many of the uh, things in the exhibit uh, are works by male artists. Uh, these people obviously asked me to make a special effort to look for uh, works by women artists that could fit in the exhibit, and I did, and as I'll say in a moment, I think, uh, had a kind of uh, 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 windfall, which I'll describe to you in that respect. Uh, here is uh, a well-known work by one of the famous uh, woman artists of 16th century Italy. Uh, she is uh, Sofonisba Anguissola, uh, who really was a kind of uh, child prodigy in an age when uh, no one remotely dreamed of uh, sending women to become artists or apprenticing them to major artists, even as a very young woman, Sofonisba, uh, showed a uh, passionate interest in art, remarkable talent. Uh, Michelangelo is said to have seen a drawing by her and praised it. Uh, and here, in a work that is uh, in the city of Lankut uh, in Poland, uh, she shows herself, she's the woman uh, with the brush in hand at the easel, uh, painting uh, Mary and the Christ Child. Uh, and so uh, this uh, work I very much wanted for the exhibit we succeeded in uh, getting because it, it, it really uh, sums up an aspect of the question in a very eloquent way. Uh, and uh, Sofonisba was certainly always conscious of the fact that uh, she had a hard road to hoe, uh, that uh, it was all uphill for her. Uh, and so uh, if she shows herself doing what arguably is the most uh, frequent subject in religious art in the past, Mary and the Christ Child, <coughs> uh, she's presenting herself as uh, a full member of the artistic community. Uh, uh, women often in uh, that age and later uh, were accepted as uh, genre artists, as painters of flowers, uh, or uh, of landscapes a bit later. Uh, here, Sofonisba is making the point that she does the same kind of art that uh, men do, uh, and she seems to be pretty sure of herself. So that's uh, a work that uh, I was uh, very pleased to have. But uh, really, uh, beside Sofonisba and the other very famous uh, late Renaissance woman artist, Artemisia Gentileschi, a work on you'll see in a moment, I was a bit uh, uh, puzzled as to where to go to find people uh, whose art would fit into this exhibit. Uh, I would have liked to bring the chronological range right up to the present, because Mary is a timeless theme, uh, but the museum uh, did not want that. It wanted to stop the whole thing at the uh, early 19th century. Um, and uh, in practice, since I was drawing for the works that I 
was fairly sure I could get on uh, friendships here in uh, Italy uh, and uh, uh, mainly in Florence. Uh, the works that uh, I bring uh, to the exhibit are mainly uh, Florentine Renaissance uh, and uh, Italian uh, works. Uh, and uh, I needed women artists who could fit into that framework. And I, I was not having much luck, uh, but at the same time, since as Linda said, I uh, do actually far too much, I accepted the invitation to organize an exhibit, uh, not an exhibit, but, uh, a symposium in North Italy uh, on a positively wretched artist named uh, Guglielmo Caccia. Uh, from a small place in Piedmont uh, called Moncalvo, give you a, an idea of the uh, provincialism of this place if I say that he has for centuries been known as the Raphael of Moncalvo. <laughs> um, and and I, I was unhappy about this. I did it uh, out of friendship because the larger uh, uh, milieu of which he was a part did interest me. Counter-Reformation painter, I'm very interested in questions of religious iconography. And as I studied him, uh, it, it came to light that uh, he uh, really run a kind of family shop. And uh, his children, he had uh, a son or two, but he had lots of daughters. And he trained his daughters to work with him in his shop. He had a little industry grinding out large altarpieces. And several of his daughters became skilled painters. One in particular, uh, whose name is uh, uh, Maddalena Caccia. Uh, she and uh, two of her sisters became Ursuline nuns, uh, and so left their father and went to a neighboring town where the Ursuline convent was. But they perhaps missed uh, the work that they had with their father in the shop. Had been trained as painters. He certainly missed the help they could give him. And so this man, uh, in about uh, 1601, did an absolutely extraordinary thing. Uh, he was very wealthy, quite successful in this small world in which he worked. He went to the bishop of the diocese and he said that he wanted, in a wing of his very large and handsome house in Moncalvo, to create a convent. And uh, he would uh, bear all the costs for transformation of the wing, so it would become a convent. Uh, it would be an Ursuline convent. Uh, if the bishop would help him gain the, uh, the acquiescence of the superiors of the Ursuline order, he wanted to bring his daughters home, but they were nuns, so he would put at their disposal a convent that he would create in a wing of the house. And all of this gets done. There's actually his letter with a drawing of exactly how the wing of the house is going to be transformed. Uh, and today this would be unthinkable. Uh, in 1601 it wasn't. Uh, and so uh, the girls come home and uh, they work with him uh, until his uh, death in uh, 1625. Uh, and what you see on the screen is a work by uh, the really talented daughter, um, taken the name Ursula as a nun, so she's called Ursula Magdalena uh, Caccia. Uh, and uh, as her father passes from this world, she probably assumes a commission that he'd been working on. We have drawings by him of this subject, which is the evangelist St. Luke in his study. Um, and uh, she paints it in a way quite different from what her father's drawing suggests he had in mind. Uh, the subject is a traditional one. You find it in uh, medieval and uh, Renaissance art. Here we're in the 17th century. Uh, and it derives from the uh, early Christian assertion that St. Luke, uh, who, according to uh, the letters of St. Paul, was a doctor, was also a painter. Many icons uh, in the Christian Orient uh, uh, are attributed, certainly falsely, to uh, St. Luke. But the tradition that he was a painter uh, is, is very old, and that was the subject he was St. Luke, uh, painting uh, the Virgin Mary. Um, this was an important subject in the Counter-Reformation uh, when uh, Protestant Europe, not very far from Piedmont, where this woman lives in her home and convent, um, had basically eliminated sacred art from churches. Uh, the Protestants didn't like sacred images in the churches. The Catholic Church reacted to that condemnation of 
what Protestants said was the idolatrous use of images by uh, emphasizing images, by filling churches with more and more images. And so uh, the subject has a certain timeliness in its context. And what is absolutely surprising is that uh, Ursula Magdalena shows St. Luke uh, not only as a painter, but also as a sculptor. That's just not part of the legend. So she makes him a complete artist. And she's doing that almost certainly because uh, one of the big uh, intellectual debates uh, of the late 16th and uh, early 17th century uh, that really stems from uh, Florence uh, is the debate on which of the arts is the best. Uh, it uh, all makes reference to a uh, survey made by Florentine intellectual Benedetto Varchi uh, who asked artists to explain the painters why they thought painting was better, the sculptors why they thought sculpture was better. And uh, here, this woman in remote Moncalvo uh, is apparently fully aware of this uh, debate uh, and uh, shows St. Luke having already finished the painting, which is there at your right as you look at the slide, and at work on a sculpture. Uh, this was an altarpiece, it was meant to go above an altar, the Eucharist would have been celebrated right below the sculpture, the idea of the more, reali the more uh, real, because three-dimensional uh, kind of art, sculpture being set right above the Eucharist may have uh, some meaning. What's most interesting in this is the way she uh, tells us that St. Luke is an evangelist. Um, the evangelists are the writers of the Gospels. Uh, and uh, right behind the figure of St. Luke, you see a table uh, surmounted by bookshelves. Uh, on the bookshelves, you have volumes uh, whose titles are actually legible in the original, and they're all ancient texts on medicine. So she, you see Galen, all right? Uh, so she, she, she's a nun, she knows her Bible, she knows that St. Paul says Luke is a physician, and so she asks herself, what texts could a first century doctor have studied? Now, she gets some of the dates wrong, she has a number of texts in there that are a bit later than St. Luke, but it's an amazing, uh, I would say unique effort to really identify Luke. This woman was quite remarkably uh, cultured, and then she does something which is uh, brilliant. Uh, he's the writer of a gospel. Uh, and so right above his head, right above his head, you see a double-tiered uh, reading stand. Right? On the upper part of the reading stand is an open book, and one can actually read in the original the words which are in Latin, the beginning of the Gospel of St. Luke. So he had begun to write his gospel. Uh, he says in the prologue to his gospel that he has... Uh, studied all of the available sources. He's the only evangelist who says that basically he wants to put all of this information in order in an intelligible way. And so he's, he says that he studied all of the sources. And so on the table, she has books with bookmarks in them. He's been, by the way, our students are when they write papers, they used to be, now they do it all on the computer, all right? Uh, and um, on the lower level of the lectern is a page uh, with notes on it. So he's been taking notes from the books he's been studying. He's interrupted the writing of his gospel in order first to paint Mary and the Christ child, that's his sole subject, Mary, and then to sculpt Mary and the Christ child. And what she's saying, I believe, is a direct response to the Protestant affirmation that art has nothing to do with Christian faith, only the Bible, sola scriptura, Luther had said, uh, had value. And what this woman is saying is, sure, scripture is of enormous importance. And so I'm showing you how carefully St. Luke documented what he was going to write. But even inspired writers have to form images of what they are going to write about. And so she shows us Luke suspending the writing process in order to work through how he imagines Mary and the Christ child, St. Luke describes uh, Mary more than any other of the evangelists, uh, and we see that he will go back when he's finished the sculpture, he'll go back to writing. So this is a remarkably uh, perceptive, uh, 
imaginative, original. You know, no other case in the whole history of art where an artist tries to do something of this sort. She's showing you the evangelist who has stopped writing for a period in order to create visual images and who on the basis of how he's worked through his imag imagined personage, Mary, will go back and write the text. So, uh, since I had done this uh, symposium and met all of the people who still have these paintings in the churches up there in Piedmont, uh, basically I uh, uh, did a, an act of uh, inspired piracy since they wanted women artists. I'm taking seven paintings by Ursula Magdalena Caccia uh, to Washington. It will be the first time that uh, she's seen in the States. I'll show you some more of these things as we move along. Uh, here, simply to give you a sense that all of this really is for an exhibit. Uh, I'll show you one of the uh, many uh, renderings that they've sent me over the months as we try to work out where to put the things and uh, how to say that now it's, it's all uh, decided and indeed uh, in uh, a month and a half they'll start actually constructing the uh, um, uh, walls uh, for uh, some of the spaces that we use are not the actual architectural ones but that's simply to give you a sense of how an exhibit is, uh, is put together. Uh, I uh, have divided the theme, picturing Mary, uh, into uh, uh, different uh, sections uh, because that helps the visitor to the exhibit uh, organize the kinds of ideas that you're communicate, uh, communicating and it, it gives a sense to the inevitable uh, change of space as you move from one room to another. Uh, the opening section of the exhibit uh, is uh, simply Madonna and Child. Uh, it is a series of uh, Florentine uh, and Venetian, uh, or Ferrarese uh, and Venetian uh, representations of the classic subject, uh, Mary and the Christ Child, shown in uh, a somewhat formal way. What do I mean by form? Here is one of the real uh, small victories uh, in this whole process. I was able to convince the uh, uh, Provincia di Firenze, uh, which is like the county of Florence, uh, which is located in what was Palazzo Medici, um, to lend uh, the most important movable work that they have, uh, which is this small uh, panel, uh, it's about this high, uh, by uh, Filippo Lippi, Fra Filippo Lippi, uh, painted for the Medici mansion uh, in the 14th. Uh, 40s, uh, in all likelihood, uh, it shows Mary and the child. Uh, but there is uh, a, a certain formality about it. Mary, uh, quite inexplicably, is set into a niche as if she were a statue uh, behind this kind of marble wall. Uh, Filippo Lippi creates around her, that is to say, a sumptuous and rather ritual setting uh, that, in a sense, uh, contradicts what uh, appears to be uh, the uh, intimacy uh, and even spontaneity of the relationship between mother and child. It appears to be until you look closely at it. Um, the child is embracing uh, his mother. Uh, mother has this uh, gaze uh, which is not directed at the child but inward and which is veiled with sadness. Uh, Mary in many of these works is shown as the mother who already knows that her son will one day have to die. And so to the charm and the spontaneity of these images, there is also given a dimension of foreboding, which is probably uh, present in, in life of another mother, obviously, but uh, I believe all mothers uh, at many points uh, think of uh, the things that could happen to their children. They have to think of these things in order to uh, educate them and to uh, protect them, uh, and uh, also reflect, uh, because adults do think of this from time to time, that however successful mother is in protecting the child in his or her infancy, sooner or later every human being has to face uh, problems and even suffering in life. And so this theme is certainly present in what uh, Filippo Lippi does, uh, and uh, another theme uh, that uh, an American uh, art historian, Leo Steinberg, called attention to in this and in many other works some years ago uh, in a book entitled The Sexuality of Christ. 
uh, is the uh, nudity of the child, the fact that his uh, infant uh, genitalia are shown, which, as Steinberg argues very convincingly, uh, is one of the ways in which Renaissance artists insisted on the theological point that uh, Christ is certainly the Son of God for Christians, but is also uh, the Son of Mary. He's true God, but he is also true man. And the way they communicated the true manhood is in the uh, visibility of the uh, pudenda, of the uh, genitalia. In this section of the exhibit, uh, there are about uh, 10 works. Uh, some of these uh, are less famous. Uh, this is a very typical work by a Florentine sculptor, uh, perhaps Benedetto da Maiano. Uh, it's the kind of work that was done practically uh, as part of uh, uh, a, uh, uh, an industry. Uh, most uh, well-known artists uh, on the side produced uh, hundreds of uh, images of the Madonna and Christ child for the private sector. Artists really wanted to work in the public sector uh, because that's how you were known, that's where you made your reputation. But they uh, paid the bills, we would say, uh, in uh, works for private patrons. And this charming work, which is in a private collection, uh, is extremely typical. It's in its original frame. It shows Mary with the Christ child. It is in stucco, an expensive material, painted, as these works were, uh, with the theological uh, reference, the Holy Spirit there, and the tympanum of the arch. It's a, it's a charming and typical work. Uh, I'm able to bring to Washington one of the most famous examples uh, of this Madonna and child type, which is an exquisite uh, marble relief from the Bargello Museum here in Florence. Uh, it is by one of the great mid-15th century sculptors, Desiderio da Settignano. It's called the Madonna Panciatiki because it was in the home of that uh, wealthy Florentine family. Uh, and uh, the slide doesn't do it justice. It is a miracle of the uh, typically Florentine 15th century technique known as rilievo schiacciato, or sometimes schiacciato, they say using an old dialect version of the term. It means crushed relief. It means uh, the artist uh, showing off his capacity to uh, model the surface of uh, the marble slab by bringing out uh, what appears to be a fully three-dimensional figure in what often is uh, a quarter inch of actual depth of carving. Uh, and uh, this is one of the uh, great examples of that and uh, an extraordinary work uh, for its interpretive uh, features as well. Uh, in this same uh, opening section uh, is a work uh, that, as I cast about, uh, whom do I know well enough to ask <laughs> to lend works to this exhibit? I realized I have known the uh, Caponi family for uh, many decades now, and uh, I, I asked them, and they uh, very graciously uh, loaned the Madonna, which you can see in the next room. I don't know if the chapel is illuminated, but it will soon be leaving for Washington, so uh, it won't leave for another month and a half. But uh, uh, This is uh, a uh, work by uh, Pontormo, uh, the uh, follower of Michelangelo, uh, and great mannerist master in his own right, who decorated the Caponi family chapel in the nearby church of Santa Felicita. Uh, so I was particularly happy to have uh, this Michelangelesque uh, work. I think it's the first time it goes to the States. It's recently been shown in Florence in Palazzo Strozzi. Uh, and uh, this will be uh, very close to uh, the Michelangelo drawing that I showed you in opening uh, because uh, they are related to each other stylistically. Uh, those are a few of the works in the first section, uh, which is the most classic subject, uh, a somewhat formal rendering of Mary and the Christ Church. Uh, the second section of the exhibit goes a step further. It is called uh, Woman and Mother. The first section is Madonna and Child, and that's uh, almost a code term for a standard iconographical category. But obviously, both artists and patrons uh, often wanted to go beyond uh, the standard category. And so what you find, actually from a fairly early period, uh, 
is uh, the occasional work which really tries to explore uh, the uh, womanhood of Mary uh, and uh, the kind of relationship she might have had as a mother uh, with this baby. Uh, for believers, he's the son of God, but the whole point of the theology is that he became a real man, which means first he was a real baby, and so uh, artists did often ask themselves, what this uh, could mean, how this could be visualized. Uh, opening this second section of the exhibit is a spectacular painting from the Vatican Museum uh, by Federico Barocci, late uh, 16th, early 17th century master. We're on the uh, verge of the Baroque here. This is already practically a Baroque painting. Uh, and uh, it's how Barocci imagines a moment not recounted in itself in the uh, New Testament, but which must, must certainly have occurred in some form, the New Testament says that uh, Joseph takes Mary and the Christ child out of Palestine and into Egypt for a period in the child's infancy because he knows that uh, King Herod is trying to kill all children uh, who, who might include in their number the uh, Messiah of whose existence he learned from the Magi. Uh, and so there's this flight into Egypt which is normally uh, depicted simply as Joseph leading a donkey on which Mary sits with the Christ child. Uh, but uh, from the uh, 15th and 16th century on, artists did begin to say, well, from Palestine to Egypt must have taken a few weeks. It's a long trip. And so uh, there's a whole uh, imaginable journey. And in that journey, there must have been moments of rest, of repose. And those would be moments in which the family would assert uh, its nature as family. So what Marocci imagines here is um, a moment of repose during the journey. You see a very peaceable looking donkey there at the far uh, right in the background. Uh, they stopped in a lovely place, very near a cherry tree. And Joseph is uh, gathering cherries from the tree. He's passing uh, uh, a twig with uh, cherries on it to the Christ child, who seems a uh, willing uh, Accomplice in this uh, theft of somebody's cherries. Uh, there's a theological question here that I will not uh, dwell on this evening. Uh, the uh, figure of Mary is, is absolutely marvelous. Mary is visually the pivot uh, of the image, uh, and uh, she's seated in a very decorous way, as you always see her in Madonna and child images, uh, but at the same time, she has a wonderful spontaneity, as with this uh, perhaps pewter bowl, she gathers water from the stream alongside which they've uh, stopped. Um, it's uh, a, a visually spectacular painting, as Orochi's works are because of uh, his love of vibrant uh, color and these uh, simply charming uh, forms. Uh, but it's also uh, a, a, an engaging painting for the uh, humanity. Uh, that uh, he manages to put into uh, the playful relationship between Joseph and the child, and this wonderfully inward and at the same time uh, natural and maternal figure of Mary. In this section, I show uh, one of the few very early works in the exhibit, a small painting again from the Vatican Museums by an artist named Pucho Capanna, uh, done in the 1300s. It shows Mary and the Christ child surrounded by female saints, so it's, it's all women. Huh? It's uh, the New Testament uh, from the distaff side, as it were. Uh, almost certainly painted uh, for a woman, uh, perhaps for a nun. There are two uh, nun saints there at the bottom of the painting. Uh, and uh, in the catalogue essay, uh, I stress that the whole interest in Mary as a woman really arises uh, from uh, two factors. Uh, one is the growth of cities from the uh, 12th and 13th century uh, onward. Uh, money Europeans and Jews who lived in castles in the country uh, moved into cities. Uh, a new class of people with money, a middle class, a merchant middle class arises. These people want a kind of sacred art that talks about their life. Uh, and so uh, Another aspect of life in the cities is a multiplication of the number of uh, women's 
religious houses, convents. Uh, and so this emphasis on Mary as woman uh, becomes extremely important from the, especially 14th century on, but this is a 14th century work. There is a uh, quite wonderful painting, again, by uh, Ursula Madalena Caccia, uh, which is uh, this image of uh, baby Jesus with Mary, his mother, at your left, and Saint Anne, his grandmother, at your right. And uh, this is a particularly interesting painting because uh, it explores uh, not only um, uh, the, the uh, Mary and the child, but also uh, the way a young mother uh, <coughs> relates to her own mother as the young mother learns how to be a mother, to whom should a young woman turn uh, more uh, naturally than to uh, her own mother. Uh, and, uh, this is particularly interesting in this case because the religious order, the Ursuline order, which this woman painter, uh, Madalena uh, Kacha, was a member, uh, at that time, later it changed, but at that time, had a, had a very unusual system uh, for training the women. Uh, the young women who entered the convent, uh, Madalena would have been one of them, uh, were uh, guided by older women in the convent who really established a kind of surrogate mother-daughter relationship with them. And so it's a, a very interesting work uh, in its exploration of the humanity of Mary, Mary as mother, but also as daughter, bringing up her own child. Uh, I promised you a work by the other famous late Renaissance woman painter, uh, Artemisia Gentileschi. This is from Palazzo Pitti in Florence. It is. Uh, uh, Mary uh, about to feed uh, a child who looks as if he very much wants to be fed. Uh, there's a certain eagerness there. And uh, it's uh, an extremely fine work uh, and uh, one of the few depictions that Artemisia does of the Madonna and child. And it's a uniquely feminine work because uh, while the subject of Mary breastfeeding the Christ child uh, never a common one uh, and yet is present in art from the uh, 15th century especially onward, uh, usually it's done in an extremely sedate way, uh, with, with Mary uh, holding her breast as if it were a sacred reliquary. Uh, and indeed, that's the way people would have thought of it, because there were many relics uh, with what purported to be Mary's milk in them. Uh, St. Bernard of uh, Bernardine of Siena uh, is documented as uh, berating his listeners in one of his famous public sermons because he says, oh, in practically every church in the city there's a relic of Mary's milk. What do you think she was, a cow? <laughs> uh, at all events, um, this is not the way that Artemisia shows it. She shows a very buxom young uh, woman, by no means aristocratic, um, uh, who uh, is, is about to uh, share her life. That's what it means to a woman to give uh, suck to uh, a child, in this case a very eager child, so it's, it's an impressive work. Uh, and this is at the center of the Mary as woman and mother section. I took from my own museum, the Cathedral Museum, this uh, charming 14th century relief uh, by Andrea Pisano, uh, which is uh, one of a small category of uh, works from the later Middle Ages and Renaissance that shows the mother and child actually play. Uh, uh, here, Mary is tickling the child. You see, the child is resisting being tickled but loving it at the same time, right? So it's, it's uh, an unusual work. Uh, it was made for the cathedral bell tower. It was uh, the tympanum, the small door uh, in the uh, uh, north side of the bell tower uh, that originally was where the, the, the bell ringer entered. There's a bridge from the cathedral into the bell tower at that point. The bridge was later removed, and people forgot about the relief, which is now a museum, at all events. Uh, that is an absolutely charming exploration of this womanhood and maternity, as is this uh, painting uh, by an anonymous um, uh, North Italian artist, uh, or perhaps, uh, well, probably North Italian, but uh, trained uh, perhaps in Tuscany. Uh, who is known to our historians simply as, as, as the master of the winking eyes, because in, in his paintings uh, the, the personages always seem to be kind of winking at you. 
Uh, and it's his way of, of saying that they're, they're very happy and they're laughing. And uh, here, uh, again, what he's shocking you is a very playful scene and something almost unique in Marian iconography because, yes, you see Mary is sort of uh, tickling the child, the child is moving in her arms, but uh, the child has worked his way up onto his mother's veil. Mm -hmm. A single veil covers mother and child. This is also a theological reference because the way early theologians speaking of Christ's humanity described it was as the veil of humanity which he took from Mary to conceal his divinity. He does not choose to appear as God but rather as baby and then as man uh, and he veils his divinity in a humanity which he takes from Mary because she's his mother, that's where his body is made, her body. Uh, and the artist is alluding to these things uh, by covering the child's head, but it's also something that babies do. <laughs> so it's, it's a quite remarkable thing. The third section of the exhibit uh, is dedicated entirely to the theme that I've already mentioned to you, uh, that of Mary's foreknowledge of her son's passion and then of Mary's sharing in his suffering uh, when she was present with him uh, at Calvary at the foot of the cross. It's called the Mother of the Crucified, so Madonna and Child, Woman and Mother, Mother of the Crucified, and the uh, work with which I open this section uh, is a painting by Sandra Botticelli uh, in Milan at the Old Fetzola Museum, uh, which they absolutely did not want to let me. Um, and then they had to come to me, because they're doing an exhibit on the Paul Iwola brothers, and ask if the uh, Museum of the Opera del Duomo would consider lending them this uh, extraordinary, very large, uh, six foot tall silver cross that uh, Paul Iwolo did. Uh, and I said, of course, there's no relationship between your exhibit and what I'm doing in Washington, <laughs> but if we could somehow. <laughs> so we did a little horse trading there, and they got their Paul Iwolo, uh, and I got uh, the Botticelli. Uh, it is um, the Christ child to whom Mary, quite improbably, has been uh, teaching uh, to read, uh, we assume. Uh, but he turns from the book and looks at her, and you see that in his, perhaps you can't see it, uh, in his um, uh, uh, left hand uh, are three small gold nails, and around his left wrist, as if it were a wrist, as if it were a charm bracelet, is the crown of thorns. Yeah. Uh, and so it's uh, an image that wants to first involve you in the beauty and the charm of the Madonna and child, but also then insist upon the fact that uh, this is colored by this foreknowledge. Mary knows her son will one day have to suffer. Uh, and according to the New Testament, he, from the moment he comes into the world, understands that he's been given a body so that he can offer that body on the cross. Um, obviously, uh, the catalog and some of the didactic material that accompanies the uh, images uh, tries to give keys to reading uh, the levels of meaning in these works. Uh, that, though, is a particularly handsome work. Uh, and then in this, sorry, uh, in this section, uh, we have a number of works that actually describe uh, the uh, tragic moment when older Mary sees her adult son die on the cross. This is an anonymous relief by a North Italian artist in a private collection in Florence, uh, which is simply extraordinary. It's a late 14th century, or beginning of the 15th century work. Extraordinary for the uh, uh, plangent uh, uh, intensity of the figure of Mary there uh, at your lower uh, left, uh, gazing up into the face of her son from the same collection. These are dear friends who have extremely fine things. Um, I was able to get a rather large painting by Giorgio Vasari, it's a 16th century painting, uh, which uh, shows Christ crucified uh, near Florence, because the background view is that of uh, Florence. Uh, and there you have a very standard image of Mary grieving at the foot of the cross. Uh, she's the standing figure. The other Mary, Mary Magdalene, is 
uh, kneeling and uh, kissing Christ's feet. On the other side, you have the beloved <coughs> disciple John. Uh, again, from uh, the uh, Capones, um, uh, in addition to the uh, Pontormo painting from the small chapel here, uh, I was able to uh, get the stained glass window that you see now uh, to your right when you look through the glass door of the chapel. Um, it is uh, an extremely famous work by one of the great masters of stained glass of the early 16th century, the Frenchman Guillaume Narcia. Uh, and it was made uh, for the uh, Carboni Chapel in Santa Felicità, now, where today you see a copy of this. And it was made for the position that I show you in this uh, photograph of uh, the side wall of the chapel, that is to say, uh, for a position between uh, two painted figures by Pontormo uh, depicting the Annunciation. The Annunciation is the moment when Mary conceives the Christ child. Uh, between those two figures, the angel who announces and Mary who says yes, uh, you have this image of uh, the adult Christ being carried to burial with Mary in the foreground at your lower left uh, grieving. Uh, so this uh, strong sense of uh, the uh, whole life, both of Christ certainly, uh, and from the moment of her conception of Christ, that Mary also has focused on uh, the supreme act uh, of his uh, existence, the uh, crucifixion followed by the uh, resurrection. Um, and then in this same section, uh, an extraordinary uh, relief from the Caponi Church here, Santa Felicita, uh, work by Luca de la Robbia, a Madonna and Child, in which, uh, if you look at Mary's face, I think you see that the artist's intention really is to capture that, that sense of foreboding. It becomes an important theme in Florentine art because artists ask themselves, uh, well, uh, how did Mary, as true mother, uh, react to what she understood as religious woman, as devout Jew, uh, knowing herself to be the mother of the Messiah, understanding that he would have to die, how did she put these things together? As mother, she should want to protect him. As uh, devout uh, uh, worshiper of God, the God who had told her she would bear his son, uh, she, she has to be willing to sacrifice him. And in the uh, puzzled look in the look almost of interior debate that you have here. You have one of many Florentine artistic efforts to uh, grasp uh, the psychodrama, psychodrama we would say today, the psychological drama that goes on uh, in this book. It's an extraordinary work and uh, again I'm very happy to have it. And then in this section there's another painting by Ursula Madalena Caccia which is in the same uh, vein that I uh, have been describing the last couple of works. Uh, it's uh, Mary uh, with the sleeping Christ child at home. Uh, Mary has been doing woman's work. You see her basket there with uh, uh, sewing materials and knitting materials for little angel. There's there was around, uh, at least in art, in the house uh, of Nazareth. A uh, very un-Palestinian uh, landscape there through the window, much closer to Ursula Madalena's homeland up there in Piedmont. Uh, but if you look at the way the child lies on his little bed and at the, and at the gaze that Mary directs toward him, you see that the allusion clearly is to his future death uh, and uh, she obviously is fully aware of that. Uh, the uh, next section of the exhibit, the fourth section of the exhibit, is um, uh, a moment of reflection, because in everything I've said and everything that the visitor of the exhibit will have seen up to this point, you've seen just a part of that, uh, clearly there's a lot of uh, thought, there's a lot of reflection, a great many, uh, specifically we would say, theological, uh, uh, conceptual uh, uh, underpinnings to these uh, images. Uh, and uh, this section is called Mary as Idea. Because, in fact, uh, in Christian art, certainly, but also in Christian theology, Mary, perhaps almost more than Christ, 
becomes a gathering point for theological reflection. Uh, those of you who may know something about the history of Christian thought, certainly the history, uh, history of Christian art, realize that Mary is almost a more frequent subject than Christ. Um, here, from the Uffizi, a small painting by Andrea Mantegna called The Madonna of the Quarry, uh, which shows Mary, the Christ child, seated in front of this bizarre rock formation uh, where very small figures in the background, you have to go with a microscope practically, are quarrying the rock. Why would he show her seated uh, in front of a quarry? And the try to explain this in the catalog, the theme of the Old Testament, specifically of the book of Isaiah, uh, is that uh, believers are like quarried stone. Uh, Isaiah, at a certain point, uh, tells his listeners or readers, remember the rock from which you were cut, the quarry from which you were drawn, which is Abraham. He's telling the people of Israel to not forget that they are, as it were, carved out of this great uh, man of faith who was uh, Abraham. And this uh, uh, rock imagery, it's taken over to some degree in the New Testament. Christ becomes a cornerstone in a new edifice and so on. And so this section of the exhibit tries to lead visitors into some of the often rather complicated uh, and yet well-documented and fascinating uh, avenues of uh, thought that uh, Christian theology has developed around Mary. Mary is the one who uh, really uh, quarries the stone because the child is formed in her womb. Another work in this section is a 14th century sculpture from the Bargello by the Sienese uh, artist Tino di Camaino, which shows Mary as queen with a very rambunctious Christ child, if you can make him out, he's really squirming the way children do. Uh, trying to break free of mother's uh, grip. And uh, so there's a, a studied contrast between her formality with the book in one hand and the crown on her head and sitting very uh, firmly on a kind of throne there and, and the squirming baby. And then at the foot of her throne there is an inscription, Sedes Sapientiae, Seat of Wisdom. And the artist is saying something like uh, the ordinary experience of, uh, of motherhood, uh, which means coping with babies who can often be extremely uh, rambunctious, uh, is one of the places where you get wise, is one of the seats of wisdom. Mary is presented as the physical seat of wisdom. Christ is the wisdom of God, says St. Paul. But he is not being presented as a wise person, he's being presented as a squirming baby. So it's a fascinating uh, image that explores a standard. Um, the theological title of Mary, a seat of wisdom, say this at the end, say, in a new way. Uh, from the Louvre, um, a uh, superb relief by a uh, mid 15th century Florentine sculptor, Agostino di Duccio, uh, Mary the Christ Child, Angels. Um, and can you see that on Mary's forehead, uh, there is uh, looks like a brooch or something. Mm -hmm. There's this, this thing on her forehead, which actually is carved with an angel's face, the face of a little seraph. Uh, and this is a way of saying that Mary's mind was enlightened by the fact that she conceived and bore and brought up the Christ child. Okay. She has this inward turned gaze, she looks deeply thoughtful, and so on. I wanted this in the exhibit because uh, another Florentine artist in the 16th century will frequently use this kind of um, headpiece, frequently, once or twice, but still. Uh, uh, this is Michelangelo in a relief that I couldn't get for the exhibit uh, by Michelangelo in the Bargello, the Pitti Tondo. Mary is shown with the same kind of curious uh, headpiece, which again has something to do uh, with her intellectual enlightenment. Uh, Michelangelo probably got the idea for that from this relief, uh, which a recent exhibit has uh, established almost certainly was in the Medici Palace, part of the Medici collection. Michelangelo, as a boy, uh, frequented the palace. So uh, this, uh, and then uh, again from the Uffizi, uh, a painting by uh, Lorenzo di Credi, 
uh, end of the 15th uh, century, uh, an Annunciation of this beautiful landscape, and right below the Annunciation, painted as if they were carved sculptural reliefs, are three scenes from Genesis. The creation of woman, uh, reading from the left to the right, creation of woman, uh, original sin, out of any eating from the fruit of the tree, and then the expulsion uh, of uh, Adam and Eve from paradise. And that's the scene right below the figure of Mary in this. Because for Christian theology, Mary is the opposite of Eve. Uh, if humankind was sent away from God, thanks to Eve, it is brought back to God, or rather God comes to human beings in Mary. So Mary becomes the opposite of Eve, and the Middle Ages like to say that uh, the uh, name of Eve, which in Latin is Eva, E-V-A, uh, simply written backwards, becomes Ave, uh, which is the first word of the angel's salutation to Mary, Hail Mary, Ave Maria. Uh, at all events, it's, it's a word rich in theological meaning. Uh, and then again from uh, my own store, we have our museum closed, and so I could draw with some freedom, a large 19th century painting, uh, a study for one of the mosaics above uh, the doors of the uh, 19th century facade of the cathedral, work by Niccolo Barabino. Uh, Mary, uh, surrounded by the uh, Founders of the Florentine guilds, you see a man with a great bolt of cloth, you see a man with wool, these are meant to represent the Florentine guilds. Mary, therefore, as the central conceptual figure of medieval Florentine society, at least as imagined in the uh, late Romantic 19th century, uh, 1880s there. Uh, the uh, next to last section of the exhibit has to do with Mary's singular life, a number of very fine paintings, this by the Venetian artist, Vittore Carpaccio shows Mary's espousal to Joseph, and Carpaccio sets this in uh, a kind of Jewish temple. You see the seven-branched uh, menorah, uh, you see the high priest in uh, what uh, the Renaissance imagined to be the vestments described in the Old Testament, uh, and so on. Uh, I wanted this painting uh, because it is unusual in its um, insistence on Mary's Jewishness, uh, and because in the States, obviously, uh, this uh, is of great interest, this is a very significant uh, uh, Jewish population uh, that uh, does not forget that both Jesus and Mary were Jews. Uh, and so uh, I very much wanted this painting and, and succeeded in uh, getting it. Uh, I didn't have to do any horse training <laughs> for this one. Um, there are a number of prints by Albrecht Dürer, which come from across the uh, Washington from the National Gallery, which Dura did uh, a series on the life of Mary. Here's one of the scenes, Mary present at the circumcision of Christ in the temple, uh, um, and, and so on. Uh, this section is dedicated to uh, depictions of Mary's life. Uh, there's a small Titian. Uh, it's actually in the collection of one of the members of the board of the museum, uh, which uh, simply shows Mary with uh, Joseph, who looks very Venetian there. She was a Venetian painter, little John the Baptist, uh, another woman. Uh, I wanted the Titian, though, because I was able to bring from Florence a work by a Milanese follower of Titian named Simone Peterzano, uh, a larger painting and a very fine one for this artist, an artist who always signed himself pupil of Titian, pupil of Titian. Uh, and I wanted him in the exhibit because uh, the big work in the whole exhibit, ultimately, uh, is a painting by Caravaggio, who was a pupil of that Peterzano. Huh. Peterzano was the pupil of Titian. Caravaggio is the pupil of Peterzano. I have one, two, three on the same wall. It is what you would call museologically perfect. <laughs> and uh, you all have to pray because uh, this has to go final vetting before the uh, superintendents in Rome approves the decision of the owners, uh, the uh, Doria Pamphili uh, family. Uh, to lend it, but it's one of the uh, great uh, uh, early works by Titian, by uh, Caravaggio, excuse me, uh, and I believe it uh, may never have been to the States, or perhaps only once. Uh, it's an extraordinary image, again, of the repose during the flight into Egypt. Uh, you start reading it at your left as you would a written page, and you have this uh, tongue-in-cheek figure of a bumbling St. Joseph 
who's actually holding the sheet music for an angel. The legend is that they're accompanied on the road to Egypt by angels. So here, as they take a little rest, the angel picks out his uh, uh, violin and uh, plays a serenade. Uh, and Joseph is holding the music. Uh, the uh, extremely beautiful uh, angel uh, in the center, and then uh, the point of uh, arrival of your gaze as you move through the painting, this uh, wonderfully uh, tender image of Mary, who must just have fed the child, both her cheeks and his are rosy uh, as children's are, perhaps mothers too, after breastfeeding. Uh, it's, it's an extraordinary painting, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted to have it. I won't tell you what it's costing. The final section of the exhibit <coughs> um, emphasizes something that's really uh, obvious in every work in the exhibit, namely that Mary was important in the lives of believers, otherwise she wouldn't have all of these images. <coughs> but here uh, I try to focus on uh, the role that she played in the life of believers in a, a series of works that uh, can represent that role. One is a painting from uh, Philadelphia, uh, work by an anonymous uh, uh, late 15th century uh, uh, Franco-Germanic artist. It's a mass celebrated by holy bishop Saint-Denis of uh, France. And there he is at the altar, and this is assistant, and so on. But in front of him you have an altarpiece, you have a painting made for an altar. And I wanted this because, in fact, the most common subject that people saw when they went to services in church, when they went to Mass, was Mary of Christ child. That's what you normally saw above altars. There are exceptions, there are other subjects, but normally the central image of altar pieces is Mary with the Christ child. So that the bread and wine that in the hands of the priests in Catholic belief become the actual body and blood of Christ are always seen by the faithful in the past in relation to the baby's body held in his mother's arms. That's one of the uh, prime ways in which uh, the veneration of Mary is perpetuated. Often, the very vestments that priests wore, the signs of vestment from Prado, uh, had images of Mary. Here's a detail of the uh, uh, woven uh, border with an Annunciation scene. And so, the relationship between the physicality of Christ, which is not seen in the bread and wine, but which is believed to be present, his real body, his real blood, and the woman from whom he got his real body and his whole physical system, uh, Mary, that is emphasized. Here, an extraordinary painting uh, that I had in the exhibit I did up in Turin also. Uh, it's from the Marche, that part of Italy on the east coast, uh, by, again, an anonymous man. So a very fine painting uh, which shows uh, Mary with the Christ child sort of glowing in her womb, as it were, and Mary is spreading her cloak uh, to cover uh, these uh, miniature figures of the faithful, the members of a confraternity who have commissioned this work of art for an altar in their chapel, they want to see themselves as under the protective mantle of Mary, but they, they know full well that Mary is important because she, she, she bore the Christ child. And so it's an extremely expressive painting. We could not do it without uh, a uh, Madonna del Rosario, uh, especially in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries, the uh, devotion of the rosary recitation of, if you do it fully, it's 150 Hail Marys uh, and 15 Our Fathers in Glory Be the Fathers, but the people do a third of that at a time. Uh, and those, uh, the recitation of those mantra-like prayers uh, uh, is, uh, is focused uh, by uh, meditation on the uh, different mysteries, the uh, joyous mysteries, the sorrowful mysteries, and the glorious mysteries of Mary's life, which are events in the life of Christ in which Mary participated. And that gets represented in many works. This is a, a I forget his name at the moment, actually, Florentine artist of the uh, late 16th century, and a painting from one of our country churches. Uh, and uh, it shows a kind of rosary with images of the events in which Mary shared in Christ's life there behind her. A typical devotional image, uh, which uh, is the kind of thing that uh, drove home, even to simple people in remote places, the importance of Mary in uh, the 
Catholic understanding of Christianity. I've gotten this out of sequence here, but this is a print by Rembrandt uh, of uh, the death of the Virgin, uh, and uh, it should have been in the singular life section, but uh, I got it here. And the last work, the work that I conclude the exhibit with, is um, again a painting by uh, Ursula Mandalena Caccia. Uh, and uh, it's, it's Ursula as an older woman, this is one of her late works, uh, who has been asked to depict uh, another woman, uh, another nun, uh, a woman named uh, Blessed Ozana uh, de Andreasi, uh, who was from Ursula's part of the world, from a place near uh, Mantua. Uh, and this uh, nun, who lived as a hermitess, uh, was very famous in her own time, uh, and had a number of mystical experiences in which she felt that Christ was very close to her. And uh, one of these was a sensation, as other uh, women mystics have had, that she was married to Christ. Uh, and so our middle-aged woman painter, uh, Ursula Madonna Caccia, is asked to paint this other woman who lived 100 years earlier, uh, and whose mystical experiences, but also whose psychological sufferings, as she lived a solitary life of prayer, uh, were fairly well known. And so there's something autobiographical about this. Ursula Mandalena is putting herself into that uh, older and, and rather weary uh, nun who is kneeling in front of Mary and the Christ child. The child is actually putting a ring on uh, the nun's finger, so it is a mystical marriage, as that is called. Uh, but what I love about this, uh, the nun herself is shown carrying a cross. And that's a standard image in a Christian life. Uh, Christ says, if one, someone wants to follow me, let him take up his cross, let her take up her cross and follow me. And so the way people think of uh, the sufferings imposed, usually by our duties, by our state in life, is as a cross. So here, this Nun is shown carrying her cross, but do you see uh, an angel has picked up the back of the cross, and Mary, uh -huh. with her left hand, is adjusting the cross on the nun's shoulder. It's, it's delicate, it's charming, it's absolutely original. And then in the heavens above all of this, uh, this scene of intimacy in which that woman's suffering is also made clear in these symbolic terms, you have these marvelous. Uh, typically Baroque uh, angels, here we're about uh, uh, 1640, I believe. Uh, so we're in the mid 17th century, full Baroque painting and all, having a blast up there in heaven. Um, this is, uh, uh, these are a few works uh, from the exhibit, which has about 60, uh, between paintings and statues and uh, uh, other kinds of uh, works in it. Uh, and. Uh, I hope I've been able to communicate uh, my own pleasure in organizing it. Uh, it's been a long haul, but also a very uh, fascinating one. And I think it will be a superlative exhibit. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you and congratulations. It's an extraordinary exhibit. Um, now one wonders whether it will come to Italy. Could it not come to Italy as such and maybe uh, we could all see it? Uh, will you take a question or two? Uh, so, Alessio, you have the microphone. Let me also tell you that we just recorded this lecture and as of this year, we're recording all of our lectures and we're going to put them on a Stanford and Florence YouTube channel so that you can also uh, share them with friends. They might also be hooked up with the Stanford on iTunes a page, which I encourage everybody to visit. There are great courses and great lectures there. But we're not there yet. We hope to get there. We will. It's just a matter of time. But so you know that people can, people going to Washington for the exhibit should hear uh, Timothy Bergen speak about it. So thank you again. Let, let me answer your question, though, Linda. Uh, actually, uh, as word got out about this exhibit, uh, friends in Milan who are planning to do some kind of exhibit in relation to Expo, uh, saw that we'd be finishing in uh, Washington uh, in 
good time for Expo. Uh, the exhibit will end in uh, early April, just after Easter. Uh, and uh, they very much wanted to try to bring the exhibit to Expo, uh, but uh, those, those uh, old ladies in Washington said, no, this is uh, our exhibit, and uh, they would not uh, approve. Also, realistically, the people who loaned me the paintings would probably not have been uh, willing to prolong it another three, four months. We'll do a new one for the Italian audience. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. My, my question is, and I was struck by the one painting of Mary with the Florentine gills. Is there much depiction of Mary on her own after the birth of the Christ child? I can't recall seeing much art that truly addresses the answer is no. Mary, uh, in older art, is uh, almost always shown uh, with uh, the child or conceiving the child in the scenes of the Annunciation. Um, in the uh, 17th century, there's a growing interest in her as a person. You start to see images of Mary as a child. That's one of the other subjects, even in older art. Mary being presented at the temple, because the legend is that she's brought up uh, in the temple. Uh, you start to get very charming images of Mary as a child, uh, but uh, the, the adult Mary uh, is almost always shown with the Christ child or at the moment when she conceives him uh, uh, until the uh, late 18th and the 19th centuries. Then, then you start to get images uh, of Mary alone. Uh, in, in Christian uh, usage, uh, the veneration of Mary uh, is related to her role in the mystery of salvation, and so to show her uh, somehow separate from Christ just didn't occur to people. This was not done. What triggered that change? One of the important things uh, that triggers it is uh, the uh, Marian apparition at Lourdes. Uh, Bernadette at Lourdes sees Mary without the Christ child. Mary speaks to her, and so one of the um, first strong uh, iconographical uh, themes of Mary alone is the uh, uh, Mary as she was described by Bernadette of Lourdes. Uh, she was traveling alone, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, thank you. Um, thank you for showing us uh, this preview of the exhibit because I imagine most of us will not get a chance to see it firsthand. Um, how about Mary uh, pregnant? Aren't there a few images of Mary as Absolutely. future mother? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, in, in the show, uh, I have um, a marvelous um, illuminated page, uh, 15th century illuminated page, uh, showing the visitation uh, when Mary, after conceiving the Christ child, goes to visit her elderly cousin Elizabeth. They're both pregnant, and that's really the theme of this meeting. Uh, really, Mary had just got pregnant, so she shouldn't yet be visibly pregnant, and yet artists often showed her because they were fascinated by the idea of these two women uh, who were pregnant uh, meeting. Elizabeth was uh, six months uh, ahead, uh, and uh, uh, actually, a, a painting that I didn't include in this uh, uh, selection this evening by uh, Ursula Maddalena uh, shows uh, the aftermath of the visitation. Mary goes to be with Elizabeth in the last period of her pregnancy, the last three months, and then the Bible doesn't say it, but you suppose she stays for the birth of Elizabeth's child, who is John the Baptist. So this painting shows uh, the child of John the Baptist uh, who has been, been cleaned. Uh, you see the servants with the bowl that cleaned him near the fire in the foreground. Uh, it's all women in the, in the, in the foreground. Very marvelous. It's a, the woman who commissioned it is there with her little daughter uh, in this beautiful dress. <laughs> and and uh, then you have the, the women who would have been part of the story. Uh, in the background, you see the bed with Elizabeth and uh, people bringing her food because she's weakened after uh, giving birth. Uh, and at the center of the foreground is this young woman who can only be Mary. Uh, she's put at the center, and the baby is being passed to Mary. Baby John the Baptist is being passed to Mary, so she's holding the baby on a cushion right above her own womb. Mm. Uh, 
And at that point, she would have been three months pregnant. Uh, and so this is the woman, Ursula Madalena Kacha, thinking of what it means to a pregnant woman to hold a newborn baby in her, I mean, it, it's amazing. Uh, and then you, you, you know what it all is talking about because the, 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 the lamb, uh, which is the image that John the Baptist as an adult will use to identify Christ, behold the lamb of God. And so right in front of Mary, looking up at John the Baptist, because right beneath Mary is this little lamb. <laughs> it's all, uh, there's a still life in a corner with grapes, so you know you're talking about the Eucharistic wine. Uh, but but it, it's this psychological exploration of what I would think are uniquely feminine themes. Male artists don't really get to many of these ideas. A woman artist did. That's why I wanted to bring this. Uh, I should have put that in the show. Does that answer your question a bit? Then there are these marvelous images of, of Mary actually uh, with with the. Uh, her stomach swollen, uh, pregnant. A famous one is by Piero La Francesca. Um, in the exhibit that we did in Turin uh, on the, the, the body and face of Christ in art, uh, I actually had a, a wood statue, which is from Piedmont, 15th century wood statue, which shows Mary uh, with her protuberant stomach. And where her stomach is, there's actually a drawer in this yeah. statue, which, which can be opened and it's the baby. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Allora, grazie tanto. Thank you.